see. Welcome, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is a Professor Elick, uh, uh, instructor of political science at Langston University. Welcome to week five, lecture one. Uh, this is, we're going to talk about um, federalism. For those of you who are in the online class, uh, welcome, welcome. I'm glad you're still here and many of you are doing very well. Uh, to anybody who may be viewing on YouTube, welcome. I want to talk to you about uh, last week. I did say I was going to send out a, a third video about how I want my questions answered and I wasn't able to get to it. And I do apologize. So right after this video is released, there will be a video that will go over week two's assignment, essentially, not week two, week three. And I will go in there and explain exactly what I want to see. And I will be direct and, and straightforward. So you will have no problem figuring out what I need. Also, if you have questions, come to me, please come to me. No one's coming to me and I'm seeing grades that I don't like. So if I come to you with these uh, about your grades, it's almost too late. So come to me if you have questions. Remember, you can always come to me by going to the discussion area. Uh, let me sh let me sh uh, share my screen here. You can always come to me by going to the discussion area uh, in Canvas. Just simply uh, let me move that out of the way. Right here. Let me look at it from your point of view because it's best to see how you're seeing things compared to what I'm seeing things. Could be totally different. Go to discussions. And from discussions, go into general questions. And if you have any questions, like uh, just put it right here. Just simply write, reply to me. And I will answer those questions. I only had one person leave a question in there. And it makes no sense. I'm here to help you. And, and none of you guys are reaching out. So it's not a high school, guys. If you have questions, reach out. You Look, you go to the University of Langston in HBCU in Oklahoma. It's the one that's furthest out west in all HBCUs. We have an enrollment in less than 5,000 students. You know what that means? It means that you have the opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with your professors all the damn time. Do you know people pay fifty, a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars a year for this opportunity to be able to speak to their professors one-on-one -on -one and help them through? And you have the luxury of that. And not too many people are using it, which is a damn shame, which seems like uh, it's a problem with most Americans anyway when it comes to apathy, uh, when they have access to rights or when they have access to something good. They don't use it. But yet they complain that, well, someone wasn't there for them or they complain that uh, uh, I didn't get the best thing out of it. I mean, what do you want? I mean, offering direct access to your professors want to be able to help you. But if you don't show up and make your effort, then what is the point of this? I mean, I'm not going to hold your hand like you're in high school because you're adults, but you have to make that first step. It's like a contract I've made to offer to you. Only thing you have to do is accept it. Once you accept the offer, then we have a bond or a contract together. The consideration would simply be you putting in time. So if you need help, if you're sitting out there wondering, what the hell is Professor Elix saying? Or how is he grading? Speak up. Don't just sit there. Don't just sit there. But if you decide to sit there, you don't do well, that's on you. That will not be on me. This is not high school. It's not on the teacher. In the teacher in high school, that may be on them. Or you can run to your parents and say, hey, it's a, hey, he didn't teach me very well. Uh-uh, you're in college. 
you're the adult here. It's on you. You have to step up. All right. With that said, and with my gripe out of the way, I'm going to give you the basics of federalism. Uh, the lecture that you will hear or be presented before you is just simply day one lecture. Day two gets into the weeds of the lecture and um, gets kind of boring, but that's okay because federalism is a very complicated system uh, of government. And it's not too many governments in this world that follows federalism. However, before you uh, can understand federalism, you have to understand the different types of governments in the world and the types of systems those governments are. So this is what we're gonna do today. So just whatever you got at home, Go get your go get your popcorn, go get your breakfast, go get whatever you may have. Get into your comfy chair or get into the bed or get into the corner, however you're going to do. And just chill and listen. And I will give you a quick primer of day of lecture number one of week five, which is federalism. Here we go. Do, 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 do. There we go. Now, it says week four here, but there's a reason for it. And obviously I need to revise it, but I'm not gonna worry about it. U.S. government federalism, week four, Jerry D. Elick, MLA. All right. What we're gonna understand are the different types of government. In order to understand what type of government that you live in, you need to know the different types of government throughout the world. The reason for this is that most Americans, even college students that come in, believe that the world is made like our government or all governments the same, which is far, far from the truth. Uh, but even Americans with that thought don't even know what type of government we have which is scary within itself. So let's look at the different types of government out there. First, I will name them, then I will define them. First government out there is anarchy. The second, authoritarian. Third, democracy. Fourth, monarchy. Fifth, oligarchy. Sixth, a Republican. Seventh, theocracy, and eight totalitarian. Now, anarchy you may be familiar with. Authoritarian can be confused. Democracy, believe it or not, is the worst. Monarchy, you know that about Eaglin. Oligarchy, eh, you've heard some things about it. You're not sure. Republican, it's what we are. Theocracy, it's what Iran is. Totalitarian, it's what North Korea is. All right, let's get started. Anarchy. Anarchy is the first type of government. Uh, basically, anarchy is a form of government in existence that has no order, justice, or law. Anarchy usually occurs when a government has fallen due to mismanagement, corruption, rebellion, or during a period of transition from one government to another. The term failed state is used to describe the existence of anarchy. Anarchy if we're going to refer back to uh, week three, is the closest to a state of nature that you can become, in which you have total freedom. And you're in a state of equality with what God or nature have given you. Oh, you may say, oh, that's wonderful. Then let's have anarchy. Let's have government fall. Well, no. Because remember, in the state of nature, you're equal with what you got, that what God gave you. So that means I'm equal to you. I weigh, uh, as, a, as of this morning anyway, since I'm going through a period in which I am plateau between 295 and 300 pounds after losing 200 pounds. I weigh 299. 
I have over 175 pounds of muscle and growing. I have skills of Taekwondo. So that means basically I can go up to a person that I can really obsess by looking at you. And uh, I can say that they don't have skills. I beat you over the head and take everything you have. And the only accountability would be you, maybe a couple of friends if possible, to either get your stuff back or to avenge me, or there won't be any accountability at all. And I just keep doing it over and over. That's anarchy. There is no order, justice, or law. This is the total fall of government. Or this is government in transition before society gets its act together and starts enforcing it. And when you are in a state of anarchy, and when a society finally gets its shit together, it's usually very violent because it has to be violent. Because people living in a state of nature or pure freedom don't necessarily want to go back in it, especially if those individuals are the dominant ones. So anarchy is not a good thing for it to happen. So it's not the type of government, and it's most rare, but it does occur, and there's many places throughout the world where anarchy currently reigns. Next time, authoritarian is a type of government where one political party is the elite that controls all the political functions within the government for their benefit of a specific political group. An example of a country under the control of an authoritarian government is China. China China's Communist Party controls every part of the government process on the national, regional, and local levels. Authoritarian is what it is. It's a type of government where one party is the elite that controls all the political functions within the government. It also controls uh, every almost every social and every economic function as well. So an authoritarian government, the party has clamped down. Communism, in which China says it is, no longer exists in this world in its pure form. Communism is just a name. China is no longer communist. It's purely authoritarian. So there's really not much more to explain here. Democracy. It's a government that is controlled by the people. The people are responsible for running the day-to-day -day operations of the government. Every decision made is decided by the majority vote of the people. Democracy as it exists in this form is called a pure democracy. Democracy allows for pure participation in the political process. But throughout history, this process usually breaks down. Eventually, one of two things occur in democracy. The people usually get all, give all the power of the government to a dictator, or the people provide an opportunity for a dictator to take power due to a lack of political participation. I can tell you right now, the United States does not live in a democracy. You as individuals do not control the day-to-day -day operations of government. We are not in a pure democracy. Thank Jesus. Because democracy, a pure democracy is the worst government. And don't let political heads, either liberal or conservatives, how dare you say democracy doesn't exist. It's the worst thing. It's the worst fucking thing. Because could you imagine everyone, 330 million Americans voting every day on every process of government? Imagine that. We have 535 members in Congress on the federal level that vote on things and they can't even decide what the freaking do. And they argue about 
crap. Could you imagine 330 million? And if this was a pure democracy, we most likely would give it over to a dictator. The reason being is because it, it's, the, it's the theory of efficiency. Everything in life looks for an efficient way to do things, to expend its energy. And humans are very good at that. We may even look at level of efficiency as laziness. So eventually, if a society in which you have to make the decision for the country every day, eventually will give this power over to someone who will do it because I have other things to do. I have kids to take care of. I have bills I have to take care of. I I got to go to work. I don't need to. I don't need to worry about the damn government today. And you just simply fall out of the process, or you know you vote. Hey, you know what? Let's give it. Let's let's give this thing to. Well, let's use me, Jerry. Let him decide. Okay. Then eventually enough people give it to me. And, and I said, hey, you know what? In order to do this, you know, let me have the military too, you know. Let me make the decisions, you know, so I can do it. And I get power in the military. And I said, screw it. I take over and I'll take it all. And you know what? The vast majority of you would say, sure. If you can handle it, dude, go ahead. Or I would have the military and I just simply say, uh, forget it, you know, uh, y'all suck and I'll do it better. Because you don't want to participate. It's that simple. It may happen over a number of years, but all democracies in the history of time I've ended that way. And that's why I am glad that we in the United States are not a pure democracy. A monarchy is a form of government that is controlled by a family. It's called a is, is that's controlled by a family. The understanding of a monarchy includes a royal family with kings, queens, princes, prince, and princesses. In this form of government, power changes hands through family inheritance. At the start of the 20th century, most governments throughout the world were run by monarchies. By the end of World War II, most monarchies throughout the world no longer exist. They became republics because no one no longer wanted to be controlled by a royal family anymore. But you said, well, there's a king in England. Yes, he has no power. The only royal family that has power in the world, I think, is Monaco. But I believe that the state of Monaco is slowly stripping away power from their family, too. But most royal families throughout the world have no power. No power at all. Oligarchy, the form of government that is controlled by a small group of people for their political, social, and economic benefit. The best example of a government controlled by an oligarchy is the Russian Republic. Even though the Russian government is elected by the people, the Russian president and members of the oligarchy control the political, economic, and social outcomes of the country. Russia is a damn good example. Yes, Putin looks like the strong man, but trust me, there are oligarchs that really tell Putin what to do. Or he does what he does at the pleasure of the oligarchs. Well, you may say, well, there are oligarchs over here and they were trying to get away. Yes, they were trying to get away from Russia only because sanctions were being brought upon Russia and the oligarchs that were over here were getting most of their money here. So their livelihood depended on us, not necessarily everything that was going on in Russia. So yes, they were trying to distance themselves like any group of gangsters would. But I will tell you, if things do not improve in Russia, the oligarchs will make a change. 
The form of government where the people choose their political elites to operate the daily activities of government is called a republic. The best example of a Republican country is the United States. The United States is considered a democratic republic because it consists of both democratic and Republican elements. The United States elects its local, regional, and national representatives, which are political elites, to run the daily activities of the government, which is a republic. Some government decisions on the local and regional levels are made directly by the vote of the people, which is democracy. We are a republic, plain and simple. In Article 4 of the Constitution, it clearly says each state will be a Republican form of government. We are a republic. We are considered a democratic republic because of what we do as described below. But in our hearts of hearts, we are a republic. However, republics can go into dictatorship too or oligarchies, if the people do not participate enough. And in the United States, we have a political participation problem. So if you want to control your government, you must participate. Theocracy is a government controlled by the religious authority within a country. The best examples of theocracies are Vatican City, Afghanistan, parts of Afghanistan anyway, and Iran. The leaders within the primary religion control the social, political, and economic outcomes of the country. Uh, some of the best, uh, the, Iran is the best example of a republic, if anything, in which the people vote for their elites. However, the final decision will be made by the clergy by the Islamic clergy. That's what makes them a theocracy. In parts of Afghanistan, depending on the area, since the Taliban has taken over, same thing. Same thing. To a point, Turkey is trying to slide that way, but they pushed back. Um, there are many areas. There are areas like this within Pakistan, India, and many areas. But a theocracy, based on your belief in religion, can become a problem. And it can easily become the downfall of the government. So that's why theocracy is not a good form of government. Totalitarianism. A totalitarian government is a government controlled by one individual that dictates the political, social, and economic activities of a country. The best example of a country under totalitarian control is North Korea. The North Korean government, under its dictator, controls all aspects of life inside of their country. Totalitarian means total. Kim Jong-un controls everything within North Korea. What that man says goes. There's no way around it. So when you hear people say in the United States, we're an authoritarian, totalitarian control, or we're controlled by the oligarchs, you have every right to say bullshit. In the United States, we are not controlled this way. It may seem like it <clears throat> because it seems like only a certain group of people who are the majority vote a certain way. But even when you look at that picture, it is the majority of a group of people who actually vote. Where the vast majority of people sit on their ass and don't even participate. And if they did, government wouldn't be that way. So I keep hammering at this to vote and participate, keep representatives accountable. 
But if you don't and you say, well, they don't care about us anyway, you get the government you deserve. Plain and simple. Systems of government. Now, the different systems of government are under the different types of government. We have a unitary system of government with the federal system of government, and we had the Confederate system of government. Unitary system of government. The unitary system of government is the most common system of government. The United Kingdom has the best example of a unitary system of government. A unitary system works by having a strong central government in control of all government services throughout the country. A unitary systems are very efficient and respond quickly to the need of society. Another example of unitary systems of government is within the United States, or I should say within each state. Because each state of the United States is a unitary system of government. And they control what rights the county and the city and the school boards have. But at the end of the day, it's the state legislators that will determine how the state will be run. The federal system of government. The federal system works by having two or more sovereign governments sharing power within the country. Usually in a federal system, of, in a federal system, a strong central government exists that controls the interaction between the individual regional governments and the international relations between itself and other countries. The individual regional governments have control over the people within their territories. The central government has no ability to impose itself upon the regional governments without prior authority or permission from any of the individual regional governments. The regional governments have no ability to impose themselves upon the central government without prior authority or permission from the central government. This sharing of power is very inefficient when implementing government policy. This inefficiency is purposely created to prevent any one government overpowering the sovereignty of the other. So what this means, to look at it like the United States the way we are, the federal government is the outer ring of our government. It interacts internationally, and it also interacts between two or more states to keep the peace. However, the federal government, other than what is said in the Constitution by enumeration or by being implied, cannot cannot overstep onto a state. It can't force its policies onto a state unless the constitution allows it or unless a state has agreed to it. A state has control within its borders. So it cannot impose itself on another state and it cannot impose itself on the federal government. It only has control of what it does within its own area. So at the end of the day, the state and the federal government controls its own realm. But as we'll see in the next lecture, you'll understand how the federal government can gain control over certain aspects of state behavior. But the state still has to give the federal government permission to do so. That's a federal system of government. A confederate system of government. A confederation is a system of government where individual countries have agreed to create a weakened central government controlled by the individual countries for the purpose of social, military, or economic security. 
Two good examples of a confederation are the European Union and the United Arab Emirates. The countries within a confederation had the authority to control all activities within their country, maintain a military, and engage in international relations with other countries. The central governments have the authority to regulate those areas that the member countries allow it to regulate. So like the European Union or the United Arab Emirates, all the countries within those organizations are sovereign within themselves and they can interact internationally. All the countries, depending upon uh, their charter or their constitution, give the central government certain powers. As we see in, in, uh, in the in the European Union, that all the countries are giving the central government more power over time. Now the central government prints its own currency, even though each country can print their own. Eventually the Euro will be the single currency over the rest of them. And it has slowly beginning to do that. Eventually, the central government of the European Union will be one military form government. But right now, they're a confederate system. It is something that the United States once had, but we couldn't make it work. I would say the federal, federal system for the United States is perfect. The confederate system of Europe is perfect for them. Here's also a caveat. China is under a federal system, just like the United States. Remember, it's a system of government, even though they're authoritarian government, that that party controls everything, but it's segmented just like the United States. And that's the end of lecture one. See, straightforward, no frills, no problem. Um, now we know the different types of governments and the different systems of governments. So now we understand how the United States is unique. We know the United States, it's a Republican country. We vote for our political elites. We put them in office so they can make the day-to-day -day decisions. We know that we are a federal government where the federal government does its thing while the state government does its thing. That's why it seems like when, when anything that Washington passes doesn't trickle down always to the states because it does, it's not allowed to unless your state says so. But we will figure out in the next lecture why that happens. But until then, do your best, think critically, God bless you, and you have 